Good morning from Shutesbury Community Church on this crisp autumn Sunday morning. My name is Dr. Karen Aham. I'm a missionary with Hope Armenia Ministries. And this is my second week with you so that Pastor Mark and Annie could have a rest. But they are here with us worshiping today, so we're pleased about that. Praise the Lord, he is with us. Uh, it's good to be in God's house, isn't it? The psalmist said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Okay, today's announcements. Um, the bin for gift donation for the shoe boxes is downstairs. I see quite a number of people have brought stuff. There's quite a bit of stuff down there. And we will be combining those boxes on November 5th whatever that first Sunday in November is. And then we're having a congregational meeting on October 22nd about the roof rails, again. Uh, prayer time and Bible study will come back this Wednesday, 6.15 and 7 o'clock. On October 26th, we'll be having the fire chief safety um, talk here at the church on that Thursday night. Yes? Oh. So I have the stuff downstairs, but we do need candy donations. Uh, we have the little prizes and things like that to go with the bag, with the bag. So the last Sunday of the month, if we can just say, you know, get those all put together. Um, but we'll talk more about that downstairs, and I'll show you the decorations. Okay, so for those of you online, and just said that um, on the last Sunday of October, we will put together treat bags for Trunk or Treat and um, that they do need some candy donations. They have some prize um, and little uh, games to go in, but would like some candy donations. And today is the birthday brunch. This month's birthdays are Mari, Alicia, my daughter-in-law, um, Peggy Gurman, who we miss dearly <laughs> here at Shutesbury Church, and me. <laughs> so, <laughs> so let's have uh, the birthday song. I think it's on. There we go. A happy birthday to you. A happy birthday to you. song and anybody who wants to come sing with us come along <laughs>
horses were there. Oh, well. <laughs> Psalm 37, verses 1 through 9. Do not fret because of those who are evil, or be envious of those who do wrong. For the grass they will soon wither, for like the grass they will soon wither, like green plants they will soon die away. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. Take delight in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your ways to the Lord. Trust in him, and he will do this. He will make your righteous reward shine like the dawn, your vindication like the noonday sun. Be still before the Lord, and wait patiently for him. Do not fret when people succeed in their ways, when they carry out their wicked schemes. Refrain from anger, and turn from wrath. Do not fret. It leads only to evil. For those who are evil will be destroyed, but those who hope in the Lord will inherit the land. Play. 
service where we come to God in prayer. There are many prayer needs, aren't there, in our own lives, in the lives of our families, our nation, the world. So let's go to prayer at this time. Dear God in heaven, even since last week our hearts have been broken as we've watched on television the terrible events in Israel. We thank you, Lord, that your spirit intercedes for us when we hardly know how to pray, when our hearts are just too heavy. So, Lord, please be sovereign in that situation somehow, and may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We think of our own nation, Lord, and the uh, difficulties that are here. You know all about them. You know how that uh, there are differences of opinion and Uh, difficulties in Congress. Those two, Lord, we commit to you and ask that godly people stand up and do what is right for our nation. And Lord, for our personal lives, as we go through the days and the weeks in the autumn now with schedules resuming, help us to look to you each morning to gain our strength from you. You said in your word that your mercies are new every morning and great is your faithfulness. So we thank and praise you, Lord, that you're with us here today and that the concerns on our hearts and lives you know all about. So, Lord, we take this time to ask you to be with every personal concern, every family concern, every work concern, every church fellowship concern. We trust you, Lord, to go before us and prepare the way, and we want to walk in it. So it's in Jesus' name that we commit this time of worship to you, thanking you for your great blessings, your great love that is everlasting, and the wonderful privilege it is to walk with you and serve you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Okay, now we will take our offering and... 
Pastor Mark's going to do that today, taking on a different role. <laughs> Having received such blessings from you, that we are able to come to a church and freely worship you, that we are able to live our lives in freedom, that we have freedom of speech and freedom to gather together and freedom to worship as we will. And Lord, you have blessed us also with many, many material things. And so this morning we take a portion of what we have and give it back to the church. And we pray, Lord, that this money will be used in your will and to your glory in this church, in this community, and around the world. And we pray this in the name of our Holy Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, I'm pleased to be with you this second Sunday. I like it when Pastor Mark says, speak about what's on your heart. Isn't that a nice gift? <laughs> Last Sunday, we looked at the theme of water on thirsty land. And I chose this because, well, after COVID and all that's happening, uh, we needed to think about the Lord's word in that way. But I want to just share with you a picture that I showed last week of our team in Armenia. Uh, this is the one that makes a missionary homesick uh, for our team there. I just was with them from May through August, and they're very much on my heart and mind as they go forward in the villages uh, around Armenia and several districts, teaching God's word right in the schools, right on school property. So God has blessed us, hasn't he, with a good reputation and good contacts uh, who open the doors to schools. And we teach a, a modified version of Alpha. Who is Jesus? Why did he die? What is the Bible? What is the church? How can I know the Lord? What is prayer? Um, why is there suffering in the world? Many topics. And it's a thrill for me because uh, of my 44 years in cross-cultural ministry, 20 have been in Armenia. At the beginning, there was not such open-door situation. <laughs> there was a lot of suspicion. Who is this American woman that has a house up near the big lake, a lighthouse? 
And gradually, they saw that we're not a danger to the church, but we're helping the church, <laughs> helping young people after the Soviet atheistic experience to recapture their faith uh, from 301 AD and what it means to know the Lord and follow him. So that's our team. Uh, I was saying last week that I have four brothers in America, and I have four in Armenia. I can see, you see them standing in the back there? And so God has blessed us there with a, a good team that's been with us most of those years, and they're committed to God's work. Now I want to show you also the next slide. This is an exciting time in my life because when COVID started and I was kind of stuck here in America, guiding from Zoom <laughs> overseas, someone had the bright idea that I would write uh, the history of these 40, now 44 years. Well, it sounded like, it, oh, that'll be like a penguin paperback, you know, something simple. Not so. <laughs> As I started looking back over the years from 1979, we had Brezhnev, who was the leader, then Chernenko, Andropov, Gorbachev, Yeltsin, all the way to Putin. And when I started recapping all those years, I was astounded at the memories and, and all the history that has gone on. Now, my second brother, David, who got confused many years and moved to Florida, uh, saved all my letters from those years. And, and chronologically, everything that I wrote, you know, updates and letters and what a gift that was when I started writing, because it triggered memories. So uh, we have on the left here, it's called Witness to History, a contemporary personal pioneer missionary narrative, 1979 to 2019, assisting God's people in East Central Europe, Russia, and Armenia during the late Soviet and early Soviet periods. Isn't that a short title? <laughs> well. After I was writing and including some of my doctoral work about the Eastern Orthodox Church and Protestant relations, I thought it would be great to show some pictures from those years. You know, the Soviet posters were bright red and very instructive to look at. Well, now as I've gotten into the publishing stage, the design stage, it didn't work out well to include them in the first book. So it's a follow-up pictorial chronology of the same years showing our ministries all the way through. So it's kind of a twofer. We say twofer in America? I think I, I learned that somewhere. And um, the good news is in the design stage in this autumn, I'm quite hopeful that it'll be coming out. So it was three years of writing, and then this last year of negotiating. <laughs> so praise the Lord. I hope this will be a good tool for our mission in the Lord's service to tell what God has done over I think quite historic years, would you agree? <laughs> From the Soviet times and coming through to the post-Soviet times and oh, up to today. I had to put a PS because of what happened you know, with Ukraine and the situation in Eastern Artsakh in, Ar in Armenia. I had to do a second PS too because of all that's happened. So it was basically 40 years and then plus these four uh, in addition. So praise the Lord for that. Now we want to turn to God's word. As I said, um, last week we looked at Isaiah. Before when I was here, we looked at Hebrews. So I said it's time to go back to the Old Testament. Uh, we'll take the next slide there that shows uh, what we're looking at. The prophet Isaiah. As I said last week, we talked about water on thirsty land. And some people who... Uh, are thirsting for the, for the Lord in their personal lives, uh, whether God would put them by still waters or give them a splash of water, <laughs> revive them in some way. Don't you feel that our nation needs that, that God's people are in tune to have a new revival, a, a reconstitution of what it means to walk with him and follow him in these difficult times? Well, this is part two. And another thing that has been interesting to me is Isaiah chapter 53, he opened not his mouth. Isn't that an interesting phrase? We read in Isaiah 53, he was pierced for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, 
The punishment that brought us peace was laid on him, and by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. Well done, Veronica, for having two songs about the Lamb of God, <laughs> right? Because he was the Lamb of God, a sacrifice for us. Well, today we're going to again see our Lord's passion through the eyes of the Hebrew prophet Isaiah, eight centuries before it took place. And as we mentioned last week, uh, there are 351 prophecies from centuries before, all fulfilled in the Lord Jesus. Isn't that reassuring? <laughs> that all the things that the prophets said are embodied in the Lord Jesus. Well, when I first, uh, I had been ministering in East Central Europe during the Soviet periods, very quietly, shall we say, delivering Bibles, going to Christians and training, well, let's say secretly. <laughs> we had to be very careful those years. So I promise in the book there's some adventures uh, from those years of how God helped us go from country to country. But when I landed in Moscow in the early 90s when the doors were opening, it was a new experience for me because I'd been in Austria for 12 years going in and out, the East uh, Central European countries. So I went diving right into the capital city, Moscow. Wow, that metro is really something. You've got to jump on carefully because it moves and it's crowded. <laughs> so there were some practical lessons to learn in those days. I remember um, coming out of the Soviet period, there still were not a lot of goods available. And people were standing in line. And if they'd see a truck back up to a store, a line would form fast to see what was on offer. I think there were three lines. One to stand in line and see what was there, whether lemons or toilet paper or something that really people needed to have. A second line uh, to get in line at the store to purchase it. When you got to the front of the line, they'd take you to a third line where you'd actually show your coupons and purchase it. So here I was trying to figure out what was going on as an American novice. So I'd go in one line, and I'd, I'd figure out what it was. Yes, I'd like some lemons, please. <laughs> Citrus was very desirable, but rare. And then I'd go in the second line and get my coupon, and I'd get in the third line, and when I'd... Each time I'd wait about 40 minutes or an hour, and I'd get in the third line, and just as I was about to give my coupon and get it, five or six people would rush ahead of me because there was some kind of protocol where they had nodded to the person in front of me that I've got to go in another line, so save my place here. So I didn't know what was going on. <laughs> and finally I figured it out, and I, I got my goods, and then I just said, wow, this is a different protocol than I've ever experienced. The same thing happened when I was trying to renew my visa. I'd never experienced the pushing and shoving and which door to go to, get sent to another one, and it just boggled my mind. Finally, I had a team there, and Tanya would go with me, and she knew how to handle the elbows and the, the doors and things, and I'd just stick with her. What an experience it was. Have you ever faced personal injustices in your life? Uh, maybe in the grocery line, something happens and it's frustrating. Or when you're driving, someone cuts you off. We all have those things, don't we? What is our instinct? <clears throat> to blow the horn or <laughs> to say, wait a minute, Mrs. Uh, this isn't right. <laughs> well, it's our choice how to respond, isn't it? And there are consequences to how we respond. If we start something, something is started, <laughs> right? And we have to solve it. We have to either ask forgiveness or we have to try to get some e equal things going on there. Well, the passage we've chosen today is about our Lord Jesus <laughs> and his demeanor, attitude, manner. And this is something I've been thinking about lately 
uh, not only cross-culturally, but I'll tell you, coming back to America, there's sometimes things happen that I don't understand. But anyway, <clears throat> this is the most well-known prophecy concerning the coming of the Messiah, Isaiah 53. Isaiah foretold our Lord's sufferings amid his trial and crucifixion. He would be silent as a sheep before his shearers. And all I can say today is that Jesus is our great example. There are implications for us today as his followers. Now I want to say in the next slide there that when we say he opened on his mouth, we say, well, wait a minute. This is a problem because the gospel writers indicated that he did open out his mouth before his accusers. And he did also open his mouth later while hanging on the cross, right? We have some examples. In his arrest in the Garden of Gethsemane, if you think back, the high priest questioned Jesus. Are you the Christ, the Son of God, the Son of the Blessed? Jesus responded not with silence, but with two statements that made the Jewish council very angry. <laughs> He said, I am. Now, well, that was powerful, wasn't it? <laughs> Going back to who he was as the Son of God. And secondly, he said, and you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One coming on the clouds of heaven. Whoa. <laughs> now, Jesus before Pilate, he was on trial. And he was asked another question about his identity. Are you the king of the Jews? And he didn't keep silence, but he answered Pilate, it is as you say, from Mark's gospel again. And then Jesus, while hanging on the cross, a few hours later, Jesus made several statements. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do, in Luke. And my God, my God, why have you forsaken me, from the gospel of Mark. So, the fact that Jesus didn't open his mouth does not mean that the suffering servant literally kept his mouth closed, that he never swallowed, allowed air or water or food to enter his mouth, right? Because in a physical sense, he was still living. <laughs> so that was still happening. But the phrases are Hebrew idioms that refer to a deeper meaning of speech. Now in the Old Testament, in Judges, open my mouth meant that something noteworthy was stated. A promise was made to God and could not be broken. So that was how the Old Testament understood that phrase. Then in the New Testament, we have two examples in the book of Acts. Philip opened his mouth and beginning at this scripture, preached Jesus to him. Do you remember the Ethiopian eunuch? And, and, and Philip spoke with him and used their discussion to tell about Jesus. And then in Acts 10, Peter opened his mouth and gave a defense of Christ. So those phrases are used both in the Old and New Testaments. Now, Isaiah did not mean that Jesus never uttered a word from the time that he was arrested in the garden until his death on the cross. On the contrary, Jesus chose to restrain himself before his accusers and tormentors. Rather than calling legions of angels to fight this battle, as Matthew said, Jesus humbly submitted to his enemies. Jesus chose not to perform a notable miracle before Herod to gain his freedom. He could have, right? He could have called angels. He could have said, Herod, wait a minute. Let me show you something. <laughs> you treat me this way? Well, you'll see. No, he didn't do that. And instead of striking the high priest with blindness in an attempt to convince the Sanhedrin that he truly was the son of God, Jesus suppressed his powers. It's amazing, isn't it? <laughs> that he chose not to do something to his accusers. He submitted to his enemies. He chose not to perform a miracle. And he suppressed his powers. He's our standard, isn't he? <laughs> Jesus refrained from giving an exhaustive legal defense on his behalf. There was no self-defense, protest, or complaint. Jesus, the suffering servant, was not resentful or rebellious toward his sufferings. He chose to suffer and to do so in silent submission to the will of God. It's out there in scripture for us, isn't it? The answers are there. And here comes the Lamb of God. 
Jesus is God's precious lamb led to the slaughter in patient suffering. Now, shepherds shear sheep while they stand silently, right? They're just standing there. They don't bleat. They just stand there in silence. You might think that Armenia is quite a land that knows about sheep. One time uh, we were doing a Bible study for teachers in one of the schools uh, quite a few years ago, and we came to John 10. And as we drove into the village where there were mostly horse carts, there were sheep everywhere. I said, well, this is great because we're studying John chapter 10, the good shepherd. (laughs) And as we went through all those things that Jesus said, about the true shepherd takes care of them, nurtures, leads them to water, still water, gives what they need, gives medicine. The hireling does not, right? The hireling, they don't know his voice and they don't follow him. (laughs) But the true shepherd knows the voice of the shepherd. Uh, They know his voice and and he calls them. Well, the servant, the suffering servant endured all this suffering patiently without protest or complaint. And that's why that figure in scripture is he's the precious lamb of God led to the slaughter. That's a poignant image, isn't it, for us as his followers? Well, today, how strange is this behavior in comparison to our generation? Maybe you'd agree with me. The tendency is to immediately bring out the blame game. Am I correct here? (laughs) This is our generation, isn't it? I'm not the one that's wrong. And in Armenia, coming out of the Soviet period, I sense some of that sometimes. There's an instinct because in Soviet times, you really followed what was prescribed or there were consequences. And so that instinct has come over into the post-Soviet period. Wait a minute, I didn't do that. It's just a quick instinct to say, no, not me. And I'm hoping that will diminish with the generations because it's not a wonderful Christian virtue, I don't think. (laughs) We need to stop and think, wait a minute, God show me where I might have some wrong here and what I need to do. It was unusual conduct contrary to human nature. Maybe you'll agree with me on that. (laughs) People today would be screaming and hollering, it wasn't me. Well, Isaiah's lament, when he talks about the suffering servant, he uses three very strong words to describe the violent, perplexing death of the servant. He was taken away or snatched. He was cut off, killed, hurried away. He was stricken. Aren't those very poignant phrases of what our Lord endured? This suffering was like a plague from God. God made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God in him, we read in 1 Corinthians. Well, this is not the last word, uh, the lament of the suffering servant, because God was involved. (laughs) Jesus was due for exaltation. Jewish rules would have given Jesus a dishonorable burial. He would have been taken away uh, with the notoriously wicked criminals away from the family plot for being accused of such heinous crimes, right? But God was involved. A sovereign God intervened and overruled the enemies of the servant and honored him in his burial. Do you remember? It was a rich man, Joseph of Arimathea, that took the body and buried it. So God is able to reverse things, isn't he, and to bring exaltation in the end. In my book that's coming out, I trace the fact that uh, the Soviets used the word glory to their benefit. Glory to labor. (laughs) Glory to the state. (coughs) Glory to the leaders. Glory to Lenin, right, and Stalin. And I bring out in my book... True glory is to be landing where? (laughs) The sovereign God, the the God of the universe. The Soviets were wrong in that, giving so much glory in an earthly sense. (coughs) Well, 
It's as though God put his stamp of approval on Jesus' death and began the exaltation of his servant. Jesus died a painful death with the wicked men, but God buried him with a rich man's burial. So that's something to remember, isn't it? That through all the suffering, being stricken, cut off, God didn't abandon him and had something coming. Well, what can we learn from Jesus' example? When Satan is on the attack against God's people, I don't know about you, but being a missionary these years, there are times when we just felt attack from Satan. And I, have uh, with my team, just stopped and said, in the name of Jesus, Satan, you are not welcome at this event. <laughs> the car broke down or the flat tire right at the end, you know, or the sound system didn't work. <laughs> Something major. So we just, it's happened so many times that we know now, just stop and say, this is the Lord's work and you are not welcome. <laughs> It's not like we are laying down on a carpet to be walked over by the enemy, but we have to remember the battle is the Lord's and we belong to him. Number two, when we are tempted to return evil for evil, we should remember that Jesus too felt injustice. We could give examples today, couldn't we, of things that were said about him that were not true, uh, ways that he was treated, But we have to remember, when we're tempted to return evil for evil, God is for me. God is for the voiceless. When people say that his followers are judgmental and intolerant, it hurts, doesn't it? (laughs) Uh, There are many people today that say, oh, you're just religious, or uh, why do you believe those things? Well, we remember the victory is the Lord's, the victory is ours, ultimately, right? When talking with family members, friends, or colleagues who are not interested in personal faith, we remember that Jesus set the example about the right time to speak and the right time not to speak. Love is patient, love is kind, love keeps the door open, right? It's the same in all our families, isn't it? There are those who aren't tuned in to walking with the Lord or serving him. And then, when the conversation at Thanksgiving dinner becomes heated, Jesus is with us at such times. His example of patience and restraint helps us to speak the truth in love. I remember someone saying, and not to speak the truth until we can do it in love, right? (laughs) These are very difficult things for which we need the Lord's help. Um, I've been a distant, an aunt in distant standing all these years. And I was originally just an aunt, and then I became great one day. I thought I'd been great from the start, but um, I come home and my nieces have grown and changed and things are different. And their missionary aunt gets thrust back into the situation and they go, oh boy, what do we do? <laughs> so I have the same challenges to, to live as a Christian that appeals to their hearts, too, that even though following the Lord these days is difficult, uh, we have a family legacy of faith that we want to uphold. My grandfather was a, a Baptist minister. My dad was a congregational minister. My four brothers are laymen in the church, but it's the sister that went into the Lord's work. (laughs) So I have a responsibility as a great aunt, sorry, I have to use the word great, you know what I mean, Um, to live with, uh, with them in a way that adorns the gospel. We all have that challenge, don't we? Well, Jesus' example is a tall order. Looking back at Isaiah and how he would behave, his demeanor, his manner, how he would respond, sometimes he let the Pharisees have it, didn't he? He called them, you know, very strong words. (laughs) Inside you, there's not good stuff coming out. (laughs) But he was very compassionate with other people. 
The difference is he could see right into people's hearts, couldn't he? And he could really narrow into the issues. Well, it's a tall order for us to follow the example of the suffering servant. He's really our gold standard, isn't he? Jesus is our model, our example. The victory is won. It says in 1 Corinthians, uh, the, the victory is ours. It belongs to ours in the Lord Jesus. He is with us in the midst of it all. Well, there are those wonderful words in Philippians that we want to say together. If you, can you see this? Okay. Let's say this together. Philippians 2, 5 to 11. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God as something to be grasped, but made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. So our encouragement today, when Satan is on the attack against us, we just say, stop. In the, name of Sat in the name of Jesus, Satan, you are not welcome here. <laughs> Stop bothering me. I belong to him. When we're tempted to return evil for evil, we remember that Jesus, too, behaved in a way in front of injustice that is our model. When people say we are judgmental and intolerant, we remember that the victory is his, the victory is ours. When talking with family members, we pray that he will show us when to speak, when not to speak, how to speak, how to show his love to others. And at Thanksgiving dinner, we know what to do, right? <laughs> Dear God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for Isaiah, the prophet, and uh, many prophets that are ours to grasp uh, what they said about the coming Lord Jesus, where he would be born, all about his life that was fulfilled when he did come to earth to give his life a ransom for our sins. Lord, we ask your help as, as your followers as we go from day to day. When we feel injustice or when things are difficult as your followers or when we see the horrible, shocking evil in the world, may we lean on you. May we ask your assistance, your help, your blessing, to be living up to your example because you truly are our standard. And we want to follow you, Lord, and grow in grace uh, even as you lived a life that was a life of holiness. Help us, Lord, to grow as well in your ways and live for you in ways that are pleasing to you. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Final song is Forever We Sing Hallelujah. The moon and stars they wept, the morning sun was dead, the Savior of the world was fallen. His body on the cross, his blood poured out for us, the weight of every curse upon Final breath he gave as heaven looked away, the Son of God was laid in darkness. A battle in the grave, the war on death was waged, the power of hell forever broke.
Lord Jesus, go with us into this new week. Walk with us each day, giving your mercies that are new every morning. Help us to rise in the morning with your praise on our lips, to trust you through the day, and to again in the evening ask your blessing as we rest and go forward with you. It's in your name that we give you thanks and praise for this time of worship. Be with this church fellowship in the community. May all we do be pleasing to you. It's in your name that we pray and go out today. Amen.